Hey, welcome to lecture number two in NUEN 302. Uh, last time we focused on more of the course structure, some of the fundamental uh, units that we would encounter. We introduced a couple of new units that many of you might not have seen before. Um, and we use those on scales that are more on the atom or nuclear scale. Um, and those include AMU uh, for mass and then EV for uh, energy. And so we'll be using those throughout the semester um, as well as another unit once we get to cross sections uh, called a barn, which is an area measurement, but uh, we'll focus on that later on. But these, these units are all uh, targeting uh, very small applications, in, in this case the atom or again the, the scale of the nucleus. And this class is not going to be a treatment of quantum mechanics. Um, we're going to talk about some of the some of the fundamental particles, um, but in the case of this table that we're looking at here, um, a lot of these are not part of what we would call the standard model. Uh, but for the intents and purposes of what we need to do as nuclear engineers and in predicting energy and and reactions and so forth, uh, these are the units that we are going to focus on. And so we've got the proton, which is found in the nucleus, has a charge of plus one. We'll just call that charge Q. Uh, the mass of this, as we discovered, this is not exactly true, but but for the intents and purposes of this table, it's approximately one AMU. The neutron has no charge and is also approximately one AMU. Um, and both of these are going to be what comprise our nucleus. Not to say that they can't be found outside the nucleus, but as we look at different elements and different isotopes, we'll talk about what that means for anyone who's unfamiliar with that, um, we are, we're going to focus on that nucleus, which includes these protons and neutrons. And when we add these two together, when we consider them as a group of particles in the nucleus, we would refer to these as nucleons. So how many protons are in the nucleus, how many neutrons are in the nucleus, and how many nucleons are in the nucleus are three different questions. The third of those questions is just the sum of the other two. My total number of protons and neutrons. That's my nucleons. Uh, also going down the list, there's an electron. This is going to have a charge of minus Q. Even though the mass of this is much smaller than the proton, the charge is equal in magnitude, just opposite in sign. And this is going to be found outside the nucleus. Um, the positron is going to have the same mass as an electron, but it's going to have a, a positive one charge. And this is basically the antimatter version of the electron. And then we have the antiproton, which is the antimatter version of the proton. So instead of a positive one charge, we've got a negative one charge, and it's going to have the same mass as a proton. And then rounding out the bottom of the, this list are photons and neutrinos. Now neither of these have charges, uh, but neither of them have mass either. And this is the reason why each of them can travel at the speed of light. And in fact, that's what that's the propagation velocity of these photons, regardless of their energy. The velocity is going to be the speed of light. Same thing with a neutrino. Travel speed of light. Um, there are six varieties in the standard model. There's going to be six varieties of these neutrinos. We are only going to consider two of those for the purposes of, of the calculations and modeling and predictions and analysis that we do in this class. Uh, and those are the electron neutrino and the antineutrino.
and the antineutrino. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit now about the the dual nature of light being a being a wave and a particle, and uh, kind of set the stage for this for this second uh, objective today is uh, develop an understanding of the origin and significance of special relativity. Um, and then we're going to use the knowledge we gain from special relativity to then go to this third objective, which is to apply that mass and energy uh, conversion. Um, the fact that E equals mc squared. Energy is mass and mass is energy. So we'll talk a little bit now about kind of the background, a little bit of the history leading up to that. Um, there's plenty of resources, YouTube videos, um, other courses that will go into a, a much more extensive treatment on this topic. Um, but for, for this course, we'll, we'll give you enough to, to have an appreciation of that. Um, but at the end of the day, it's do we know, do we, can we respect where E equals MC squared came from? And more importantly, do we know how to use it and when to use it? So the wave theory of light um, is shown here as part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, depending on the frequency of the wave, um, then it's going to fall or frequency or wavelength, depending on how you would prefer to think about it. Um, it's going to fall in different categories. There's a very thin spectrum of this electromagnetic radiation spectrum that is our visible light. Um, everything else outside of that, our eyes aren't tuned to recognize or, or uh, sense. Um, but we have... Um, for each of these, we have a the speed is going to be the product of the frequency and the wavelength. And for any light wave, um, the propagation speed is going to be the speed of light. So that propagation, propagation speed is C, the speed of light, and that's, that's going to be true, at least in a vacuum. And so this is the equation. Our propagation speed is going to be the frequency multiplied by the wavelength. And this, this general expression here is true for any traveling wave. Uh, we're just going to make use of the fact that when we're talking about light waves, then we know the speed. The speed is the speed of light. So the, 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 the whole conundrum was, well, if light doesn't, if, if, if there's no mass to it, how does it have energy? How does it have any kinetic energy or, or momentum? And uh, the, the particle theory of light is comprised of the fact that the that these this light that light the particle theory of light is what helps explain the conundrum if we only subscribe to the wave form of light and the fact of the matter is that it's both it's not it's not that it just it can be both it is both and it's it's just a matter of do we have the uh, what, what kind of technology are we using to measure it? What kind of what kind of uh, frequencies are we detecting? And for these for these long wavelengths, um, for the low frequencies, we just don't have the sensing equipment to to do experiments where we recognize okay, this is a this is a particle. Um, but if we do this in in, uh, in the f experiments that involving the photoelectric effect. Um, that, that, that is really what brought us to an understanding that, of this wave-particle duality, is the photoelectric effect. And what was discovered is that the energy is going to be proportional to the frequency. Um, these experiments are basically, uh, you, you can do this garage style for not, not too expensive, but um, if you have electrons on a surface and you're trying to get those to be uh, ejected off the surface of, of some object, and you can try to do that with a light wave, 
and the 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 thought process was uh, many many decades ago that if I in increase the intensity of that light, <clears throat> I will see more and more electrons. Um, but that really wasn't the case. The case was that I have to find the right frequency of the light in order to get those those electrons to then discharge from the surface, and the the energy at which that was that was taking place is proportional to the uh, frequency here by Planck's constant. So this is my frequency and this here is Planck's constant where h is going to be 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34th joule seconds. And so my frequency is, is 1 over second, so I'm left with an energy of, of joules. And this was proven again and again and again uh, through this photoelectric effect uh, experiments. And the result of all that was, was an understanding of what's called the wave-particle duality. And because there is this duality where <coughs> it is both at the same time and, and may look like one, depending on what it is you're trying to measure, um, we, can, we can then express, because of this, this energy relationship here, we can express the momentum, since momentum is going to be mass times velocity. Well, my, my uh, photons don't have mass, so how do, I, how do I reconcile this? Well, I could also express the momentum as the energy divided by the velocity. And we know that the velocity is the speed of light, so we express this energy using the relationship we now understand from those photoelectric effect experiments, and we've got Planck's constant times my frequency, um, divided by the speed of light. And so this now is my momentum of a photon. So even though it doesn't have any mass, I can express the uh, I can I can express the energy and and the momentum of this massless object, which is very counterintuitive based on Newtonian physics for example. If something doesn't have a mass, you can't really you can't have a momentum or an energy associated with it. Um, and we can use these, the combination of, of all these equations to then express the uh, photon's wavelength as a function of frequency, or as a function of energy. So if I know the energy in electron volts, for example, of a, a photon, then I know the wavelength of it. And so going back to these photoelectric uh, effect experiments, um, you know, a different wavelength in the visible spectrum at least is a different, it shows up as a different color, uh, but I, I can change that wavelength out, whether I'm inside the visible spectrum or not, I can change the wavelength and that was the tunable parameter that helped me see the, the electrons then uh, be peeled off the, the surface. And you see the numerator here, this Planck's constant times the speed of light, so these are both these are both constants. So what does that mean for us? That means we can express this just in terms of numbers. So if I if I take those and I multiply them together, then I'm left with this divided by E, which is going to be expressed in electron volts. If my energy is expressed in electron volts, then I take 1.24 E to the minus 6 divided by that energy in electron volts, and I'm left with the wavelength in units of meter. Okay, um, so that wave-particle duality um, was was quite a groundbreaking um, understanding that, that we all arrived at, and and it wasn't um, until later uh, Louis de Broglie in 1924 he extended that wave-particle duality, those principles, to things that do have mass, and in this in particular he applied them to electrons. And so he's, he's saying that that duality, even though we are expressing it in terms of photons, which are massless 
uh, particles that help us understand the, the, the transport of energy and, and momentum in light, we can apply those same principles to the electrons. And so this graph, that, this plot that you see here, um, if I'm looking at the seventh shell or the eighth shell, for example, I, I've got seven standing waves in, in this one and eight standing waves in the next one. And that helps me explain why it took a, a fixed amount of energy, a quantized amount of energy, to peel that electron off the surface. Uh, it, I can't, I, I have to have exactly that number, whatever the EV, whatever the energy is that, that helps the electron from that surface be uh, ejected out. Um, that is the energy and it can't be smaller, it can't be bigger, it's got to be that, that value. And the, the fact that it is quantized in that regard is what led uh, Louis de Broglie to make this uh, comparison between what's, what had been understood about light, the particle wave, or the, the, the wave particle duality, and say, you know what, those same principles help us explain from the electron side of that experiment what's happening. And so the consequences of this, and this, by the way, won him a uh, Nobel Prize, but the consequences of this was first and foremost that it put quantum mechanics and if you think about quantum mechanics if you know anything about it you know there's a wave function and so in particular this wave function development it put this on an accelerated path it started uh, getting a lot of great minds interested in using that framework to explain the, the subatomic uh, physics. And number two is that this equation that was, that was applied to light, to our photons, also applies to matter. In this case, electrons, but, but, but to something that has mass. And so we can, we can calculate this, what's called the de Broglie wavelength, as h over the momentum. And I can apply that to things that have mass or things that don't have mass. Um, but the, really the take home message is here is mass is energy. And you can see how that, the consequences of this sort of set the stage for a lot of interesting thought experiments and eventually eventually leads us to the uh, to Einstein's uh, special theory of relativity. So let's take a, a quick break and go do an example. So in our first example we've got an electron in the first Bohr orbit of a hydrogen atom so this is the radius of that orbit. When we say orbit, um, that was the early way of characterizing um, the electrons and what they're doing as, as a solar system model. And we know that in today's world, we know that's not a, an accurate representation of it, but Bohr's approach to modeling that did extremely well for hydrogen and some of the lower uh, mass numbers. Um, and so you think of this as I got a nucleus and my first uh, valence shell, my first shell of electrons, that first Bohr orbit. Those, those two uh, descriptions are synonymous. So we're saying an electron here has a, has a kinetic energy of 13.6 eV. Electron volt is an energy. And so we want to express the de Broglie wavelength for this electron in multiples of atomic circumference. And so we go back to the definition of de Broglie wavelength. And this is going to be my Planck's constant divided by my momentum. Um, but we can express the momentum as the product of mass, in this case the mass of the electron, times the velocity. And what do I do with velocity? I am going to look at the definition of kinetic energy because that's that's the number I'm given. And since kinetic energy is going to be one half 
the mass of the electron times, times that velocity squared. I can use this, since I know the kinetic energy, I can use that to find my velocity. So velocity is going to be the square root of 2 times that kinetic energy divided by my mass. Square root of that. And I'm going to substitute that in here for momentum. And then I'll substitute that momentum back into the expression for the de Broglie wavelength. So I've got de Broglie wavelength equals h over momentum, and that's going to be h. <coughs> We've got the mass of the electron times the square root of that 2 times kinetic energy over the mass of the electron. And so this is just going to be the square root of mass of the electron times 2 times kinetic energy. Right, and I know these things. I'm given the kinetic energy. I'm given the, uh, well, I'm not given the mass of the electron, but that, that's something I can look up. Um, and uh, so I'm not using this radius at all, this, this given information of 5.3 e to the minus 11 meters. Uh, but we're going to do this two different ways and, and show we get the similar result. So I plug in all these numbers. H is going to be 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34 joule seconds and the mass of the electron um, is going to be 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th or, I'm sorry that's my conversion from EV to joules uh, the mass of the electron is going to be 9.1094 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms that's the mass of the electron times 2 times my kinetic energy which is 13.6 um, EV and then that's where I multiply by the conversion between EV and joules which is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th joules for 1 EV and then I got to take that whole denominator and take the square root of that and so what happens with my units my EVs cancel out here my joules and kilogram so we recall that a joule is going to be a newton meter and inside that newton I've got it I've got a mass times an acceleration so I've got a kilogram times meters per second squared and I do all this math and 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 you'll see that I'm, I'm as long as I'm consistent with joules here and joules here um, you're welcome to go through the exercise of looking at all the units, taking the square root and, and so on. Um, but what ends up happening, since we're looking for a wavelength, is this ends up being a unit of length. And so this will be in meters. So my de Broglie wavelength is going to be, in this case, 3.33 times 10 to the negative tenth meters, which is going to be a third of a nanometer. So for this, for this first Bohr orbit, my first shell, um, using the de Broglie, uh, the de Broglie uh, understanding of this this uh, standing wave model of, of each of each shell of electrons, then the de Broglie wavelength in that case going. Well, let's go back here real quick. So the de Broglie wavelength would be this for my seventh shell and it would be something different for my eighth shell depending on what the overall radius of that shell was uh, but for my first shell I can have one standing wave which is basically a circle and so my de Broglie wavelength in that case um, this is the second way for actually that's, let's put a little statement here uh, for my first Bohr orbit, then I have one standing wave. And so therefore, my de Broglie wavelength is just going to be equal to the circumference. The circumference of that circle. 
And so it's going to be 2 times pi times that given information, the radius of that, of that uh, first Bohr orbit. And if I do the math there, then I find out this is also equal to 0.33 nanometers. And so this checks out. Okay, um, so let's go back now to the lecture material um, and talk a little bit more about the uh, special relativity. So Einstein had two postulates for this. The first one is that you or me or anyone in their own frame of reference, the laws of physics are going to behave as we expect and predict them to behave. And that makes sense. If I'm, if I'm moving, I have the same laws of physics in my reference frame that happens to be moving with me as you do, which might be standing still. And at the end of the day, who's really standing still? We're all, we're all moving with reference to something. Um, but the second postulate there is that the speed of light does not care about your frame of reference. It's going to, it's going to be a value, and it's going to be that value regardless of whether you think you're, you're stationary or whether you're moving. Uh, that speed, that light speed, is going to be the same. And so we'll first we'll first look at we'll do a, a partial derivation of this just to kind of give you um, an appreciation of of where Einstein went and what what his what his logic was to arrive at his final solution. Um, but as we as we look at this, we're gonna we're gonna develop two different frames of reference. One that is not moving and one that is moving in reference to the first frame. And so we have, we're going to express this in terms of two axes here. We're going to have a time axis and then we're going to have just one dimension of space. And if I go at the speed of light, this curve here represents my location as a function of time. And if I have some moving reference frame now. Let's say I'm up here somewhere and I'm going at a velocity that is not equal to the speed of light. It's, it's, uh, <coughs> it's some, some value that's much smaller than that, but it's somewhere in between the vertical line here and the vertical line would be a velocity of zero, right? My position does not move with time. Um, and so any anything less than the speed of light velocity is going to be between these two the vertical line and, and the x equals ct here the x equals ct line and so if I express this as x equals vt that's going to be my position with respect to the observer with a, with respect to the stationary observer but me in my reference frame which I'll denote, which is denoted by x prime, uh, my position with respect to my reference frame is zero. I mean, it is not moving. I'm, I'm standing still. So this then is going to be in the moving reference frame. So what do we have here? We, we want to look at x prime. Um, we've got x prime equals x minus vt. That's going to be the, sp the spatial description of where that position is. And then, according to Newtonian physics, we're going to say that time is going to march forward regardless of which uh, reference frame that I am dealing with. It's going to be the same number and they're going to be, uh, the, the clocks tick at the same rate regardless of whether the frame of reference is moving or not. And just to make sure we understand we're on the same page here, this is, this is not a correct assumption as you get to, towards the speed of light, but this is, this is according to Newton. And so the question is, how does the light ray in your frame, you are the stationary frame, how does the light ray in your frame move in my frame? My frame is, is the one that's translating, is moving. And so we'll take this expression up here uh, and we'll say that x prime equals 
CT minus VT. In other words, it's the difference of those velocities. This is, this is what we would do with Newtonian physics. We would say, <coughs> if I'm on a train traveling towards you, um, or if, or if you're, you're holding, I'm on a train traveling towards you and you throw a tennis ball towards the train, then it's going to, it's going to feel like it has a higher velocity. Or if you throw the tennis ball away from the, the train, or if I'm on the train and throw a tennis, that, that might be the better way to think about it. So if I'm on the train and I shine a light or, or, um, well, yeah, shine a light because we're talking about light rays, then the apparent speed of the light would be that whatever this light speed of light is, c, minus the translational velocity of my reference frame. Since I'm, since I'm moving away from you, let's say. So I'm moving away from you, you're at, you're at the origin, I'm moving away from you and I shine a light back towards you. The light speed to you, according to Newton, would appear like it is a little slower than the absolute speed of light by this amount here. And we could also say that c minus v times t prime. We could say that, that, uh, that the x prime equals c minus v t prime. Since we started with this assumption, since t prime and, and t are equal. So if the if the light ray then were moving uh, to the left, then my equation would look something like this, since I have another line here, x equals minus ct. So it would be minus ct minus vt, or negative c plus v times t. In other words, it looks as if it's going faster than the speed of light. And we know that this simply isn't true, right? There have been experiment after experiment with light taking different paths, and it didn't matter on the path whether the frame was moving or not. The speed of light was a speed of light. It was a constant. And so the real question to ask at this, at this stage would say, okay, we know that everything that we did here is not right. And because it's not right, that means we've got to do something to fix it. And so the question is what transformation is needed in order to ensure that my speed of light is going to be the same in both your reference frame and my reference frame. Another way to ask this is what does synchronization mean? What happens to clocks that are ticking in stationary versus moving frames of reference? In order to, to illustrate this, we'll start with a series of travelers, and they're all moving at the same speed, and again, there's, there's an observer that is, that is stationary. And so we, we sketch our plot back here, we get time, and I'm going to express this in terms of seconds, and then my x is going to be in terms of light seconds. So how many light seconds does light travel in one second? Well, it travels one light second. And so my speed of light curve here is going to be a 45 degree angle. So this will be our, and we'll just leave C off of this now, x equals t, and then this is going to be x equals minus t. That's not a very clear minus t. Okay, um, and then I've got my moving frame of reference, we'll call this reference frame number one. And so this will be x equals vt. But then I'm going to say someone started here, and they're going to move at the same velocity as, as I am, but, but we're, we're separated by some distance. We'll call this reference frame two. And so this will be x equals vt, and we'll call this here one unit, and so this will be vt plus one. And then we'll make a third reference frame here. We'll call this reference frame three, and this will be x equals vt plus two, assuming that was also one unit between 
uh, reference frame 2 and 3. Okay, so we want to we want to see what happens when we have a light shining from the origin towards traveler number two, or reference frame number two. And so we've got this point in time, we'll call this point A. And we want to say what needs to happen to the to our clocks, to our synchronization, what needs to happen in order if at, uh, if Traveler 3 on, on the third reference frame also was shining a light back at uh, reference frame number 2. Okay, so whether, whether it's I'm moving this way shining it back or moving this way shining it towards you, speed of light should be the speed of light. And so what does that look like coming from point A? Well, it's going to be a 45 degree angle back down this way. So I shine a light this way from reference 3. We'll call this point B. And basically, in order to answer the question of synchronization, we want to find the coordinates to this point. So we'll do that by first uh, finding the coordinates for point A. So for point A, let's look at this line. Well, we can we can look at tra reference frame number two and try to pick off that point, or we could just look at the speed of light line, which is x equals t. And so what we get for point uh, A is x equals t and I want to find the intersection of that with x equals vt plus 1. And if we find that intersection point, that is, that is where point A exists. And so we look, solve this for t. t is going to be vt plus 1 because x is t, so I move that over there. So I've got t equal to 1 over 1 minus v. And we'll call this ta because that represents the time for point A. And we know that it again lies on this x equals t line. And so we could just say xa equals ta. And so xa equals 1 over 1 minus v. So now let's look at line AB. So this is, this is the location and the time that it would take for that light wave to come from the origin and intersect in reference frame number two. And if we look at that line AB, uh, line AB is going to have a slope of minus C, or minus one in this case. Um, Or we could say that x plus t is going to be some constant. All along that line, x plus t has to equal some constant. It has a slope of negative 1. And so we can evaluate that at any point along that line, but we might as well evaluate it at point A because that's part of line AB. And we already know the coordinates at point A. And so we'll take the x value, which is 1 over 1 minus v, and to that we will add the t value, which also is 1 over 1 minus v. And that is going to be our constant. And so the constant in this case is just 2 over 1 minus v. And then next we will um, look now at point b. Well, we'll, we'll say this, like x plus t equals 2 over 1 minus v. So now if we look at point b, then we want to find the intersection, if we, if we scroll back up to that, we want to find the intersection between line AB, which we have an equation for, and the frame of reference um, of that reference frame number three, the, the equation that, the, the, that shows us the, the line for reference uh, frame number three. 
So for point B, then we will we need to find the intersection between line AB and the equation here is going to be VT plus 2. And so we've got line AB, x plus t equals 2 over 1 minus v, and we've got the equation here. Um, I'm going to move the, the t over to the other side. So we've got x minus vt equals 2. That's the equation of the line. And what I'll do is I'll just subtract these two so that my x's cancel out. And for the t, I'm going to have t minus a negative vt. So I've got t plus vt equals 2 over 1 minus v minus 2. So I'll factor the 2 out of there. So I've got 1 over 1 minus v uh, minus 1. And we're going to take these. We can combine these fractions, or we can, we can multiply this so that we can combine the, the terms together into one fraction. So we've got 1 minus, and I've got to multiply top and bottom by 1 minus v. And you can see that the ones are going to cancel out, and I'm left with just v on the numerator. 1 minus v, I forgot the 2 here. So that's my, that's my equation for, um, for t, well, t plus vt. So we need to take this a step further. So we need to say t times 1 plus v equals the right-hand side, which is 2 times v over 1 minus v. And so tb, this is point b, is just going to be 2v divided by, I have a 1 minus v, a 1 plus v. I can combine those two together to become 1 minus v squared. So now I've got the, the location or the, the, the coordinate point for the y-axis, which is time, for that point b. And I know that x, x equals vt plus 2 for that line. And so I can just say that xb equals v times tb plus 2. And so this xb is going to be equal to v times what I get for tb is this 2v over 1 minus v squared plus 2. And um, we'll factor the 2 out again. And so in the first term, I've got v squared over 1 minus v squared. And in the second term, I just have 1. And so let's multiply the top and bottom of that second term by 1 minus v squared. So we can, we can combine these into a single fraction. And I've got 2 times v squared plus 1 minus v squared, all divided by 1 minus v squared. And so this, in this case, my v squareds cancel out. And I'm left with 2 times 1 over 1 minus v squared. All right, that's my xb. And now that we know point b, we know the x and y locations for point b, we want to know what the equation for the line that goes through here. We'll call this line z. And since it's, it goes right through the origin, so I don't have any intercept to that line, and so my, the expression for this is just, I, I know the, I know the slope, whatever that TB is divided by XB. And if I look at TB, which is right here, and I divide that by xb, which is right here, then what do I get by dividing those two? I just get v. So the equation of that line is t equals vx. And so if we, if we scroll back up to that, well, let's, uh, it's kind of getting messy. Let's, let's, make another, uh, let's make another reference or another axis another plot here. So we've got t in seconds, we got x in light seconds, and 
I know at a 45 degree angle I've got that x equals t line. What this means is that I have I have my moving frame of reference like I did before. And if you remember, the equation for this line was x equals v t. And the 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 position in my own frame of reference it's moving is x prime equals zero. And what I found from this analysis up to this point is that I have another curve here, and this curve is going to be t equals vx. And it's here that I'm not going to say x prime equals zero, but I'm going to say t prime equals zero. And that really is the key. The, these sets of equations here are, is the, represents the key to what I'm terming synchronization or synchronous. Those represent the key to whatever I need to do in order to uh, make sure that time travels at a velocity in all reference frames. And so we'll start again with these coordinate transformations, um, but we're going to include some correction factor. Because if we approach it like we did with Newtonian physics, we know that it's, it's not going to give us a result where the speed of light is constant no matter what. Um, and then we'll force the relative frame movements to be symmetric. And what we mean by that is going back up here. This angle here and this angle here are the same. It's, they're just inversely related. x equals vt and t equals vx. And so they are symmetric about the, the line that represents the speed of light. Okay, so we've got, we've got our x prime equals x minus vt. And what we're going to do is we're going to apply some function to that. And this is, this is what we mean by a correction factor. We're going to apply some function to that. And we assume that it is going to be a function of the velocity, velocity of my, of my reference frame. And I'll do the same thing with t. So t is going to be t minus vx. And we'll have some other correction there um, for, to, to account for my, my, my synchronous, my, my symmetric frames there. And so if I look at these two expressions and I, and I say that when, when x equals t, I know that x prime equals t prime. And if I force all those to be the same here, so I've got x and x prime, or, or x equals t, sorry, x equals t, and I let uh, x prime equal t prime, well, everything from here and here are going to end up being identical. The only thing different is this top term has an f, the bottom one has some function g. And so I conclude from that, in order for these two to be the same, then that f has to be the same as that g. And we'll just call it f from now on. And so let's look at the symmetric frame. movements. We've got x equals x prime plus v t prime times that f. And the symmetric frame movements, well this is the symmetric one, this is the one we, we wrote before, x minus v t times f. It's the same function that I apply whether I'm talking about my moving reference frame or my stationary reference frame. And again that shouldn't matter in determining the speed of light. Speed of light should be the same whether I'm moving or not and whether, whichever one I'm calling my reference frame or not. And after all, if I'm, if I'm moving with relation to you, I could call myself stationary and you're moving with relation to me. That's all relative. And so both of these should be uh, consistent with each other. And I should have the same thing for time, t prime plus v x prime. And then I have my t prime equation, t minus vx times f. So these must be compatible with each other. And so let's take a look at these. Let's, let's take t prime here and substitute it in here. 
and then we'll take x prime here and substitute it in there. And so I'm left with x equals x minus vt times f plus v times t minus vx times f and all of that multiplied by this f here and so all I'm going to do is just call this f squared. And if I look at these, I can see that this vt here is multiplied by f squared. I got a v and a t here and an f squared. And so these are going to cancel out that term there. And I'm left with x equals x times, well, we'll just do it this way, f squared times 1 minus v squared. So what does that mean? Well, if they are consistent with each other, if they are going to be compatible with each other, then I can cancel my x out. And so my f, this function, we'll make that a function of v, equals 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared. This is what's termed the Lorentz transformation. And it is, it holds the key to figuring out what happens to time, what happens to mass, what happens to um, energy or, or uh, velocity, or, or I'm sorry, what happens to length and time and mass as the velocity approaches the speed of light. Um, and so I, I substitute this in for f and I get x prime equals x minus vt over the square root of 1 minus v squared. And I get t prime equals t minus vx over 1 minus v squared. And in a more general sense, because we were working with axes that were seconds and light seconds. And so the slope of the, or the, the, the equation that was my light was just x equals t instead of x equals ct. Um, but in a general sense, it's going to be this one. x equals x minus, x prime equals x minus vt divided by 1 minus v squared over c squared. And then my t prime is going to be t minus v over c squared x divided by 1 minus v squared over c squared. Okay, so now let's talk about what happens to time, what happens to length, what happens to mass. Now that, I, now that I've got a firm understanding of what it takes to, what kind of correction factor I need in order to ensure that the speed of light is going to be the same in any frame of reference, um, then let's go to uh, let's look at first look at time. In order to do this, let's let's look at another little uh, thought experiment, and we'll we'll identify the Lorentz transformation uh, here just shortly. But let's say that I have some light. And up here is a light sensor, a light detector. And this is me in a frame of reference that now is going to start to move. And so if I take this, well, first of all, let's say that the observer is back here. And if I take this and I move it all at some velocity, I didn't want to make all that. And I move this at some velocity. In order to describe that position, that's going to be V times T. 
And I know that in my own frame of reference, this light detector here is going to be C times whatever time is elapsing in my frame of reference, that's T naught. But I know to the observer, if they look at the distance that the light traveled, it's going to look like it travels in this path. And in order for that to make sense, it has to be the same time because I'm talking about my the, the observer's frame of reference, which is stationary compared to the moving. And so this line here just becomes the speed of light times T, the time that elapses in the observer's frame of reference. So for me, and I, I was moving with this, then the time that elapses from the light to hit to the detector is, is going to be T naught, and the time that it took for me to get from here to there, from there to here, in terms of you, the observer, which is stationary, was just T, and the time that it looked like from your, your perspective, the light reaches there is, is going to be time, is going to be time equals T, not T naught. And so that's this one. And so this is this is a triangle. And so we just say the C squared T squared equals V squared T squared plus C squared T naught squared. And we can solve this for T and we'll find that T is T naught times one over V squared over C squared. So again, we've got that Lorentz transformation. That helps describe now the time dilation that needs to happen, that will happen in a moving frame of reference uh, in order for the speed of light to be consistent between all frames of reference. Okay, and then light con length contraction, relative mass, is the same sort of uh, story here, but you see this this term uh, show up again and again. And in order to get to, get to the condition that, uh, or to, in order to get to the expression that, that Einstein finishes with in the special theory of relativity, then we have to start looking at um, the kinetic energy and the uh, momentum. And so in its simplest form, Newton's second law looks like this. Uh, normally we'd say mass times acceleration, uh, but now we're learning that mass is not, uh, is not some number that never changes. It, it depends on how fast I'm going. And you can see that it, it's, the speed of light is huge. Right? So it, it takes me a, a significant velocity to start to see the impact of this. But there's, there's been plenty of experiments done where you're where you're traveling quickly, obviously not even close to the speed of light, but you're, you're still traveling at a high velocity and you come back with what used to be synchronized clocks and they, they've ticked differently. Um, you know, it's a fraction of a fraction of a second, but it, but it is, is different enough to, to explain this, to be explained by this. Um, so we've got m times dv dt. I've got both of these things that can change with time. Uh, plus V times dm dt. And we're going to use this. We're going to use this to find the energy. Um, through principles of, of work. And what happens with that, um, we'll cut to the chase at this point, but what this leads to is that the kinetic energy is going to equal c squared times m minus m naught. Or I could say that mc squared equals m naught c squared plus the kinetic energy. And so this first term on the right hand side, well the second term on the right hand side, that's the energy due to my motion And this term here is going to be the energy even when the motion is zero. So I don't have a velocity, therefore this m naught here, this is called my rest mass. In other words, I don't have a velocity, it's just, it's, it's stationary. Um, but if you if you are curious to ever 
I don't I don't have a list of all these experiments. If, if you're interested, I can give them to you. I don't have a list here, I should say. Uh, but but there's been a handful of experiments that have been done with light propagation or in other fields, and all these different uh, theories that that have attempted to explain them and to capture the uh, the trends and the data seen in the experiments. And there's just one. There's there's only one that that captures all of them in an adequate fashion. And it is the basis, it's the foundation on which um, everything this semester we're going to do is, is based, is that E equals MC squared. But it all comes from, just to kind of again take a bigger picture view of this, it all comes from the desire to maintain the speed of light being constant no matter what the reference frame is. And once you, once you subscribe to that premise, then you're going to arrive at this solution naturally. Um, it's impossible not to arrive at this solution. And, they, and, and the thought process that led us down that path was from experiment after experiment that shows that, this, that the speed of light does not care what your frame of reference is. It doesn't care if it's moving or not. The speed of light is going to be some number. It's going to be some constant. And the only time we can actually achieve that velocity is if we don't have any mass. Because if you look up above at this expression here, then you see that the, the mass is going to go to infinity as my velocity goes to the speed of light. And so the closer you get to the speed of light, the more mass you have. And uh, you have to be, you have to, because of that reason, you have to be massless to actually travel the speed of light like a photon is. So. Okay, so let's go do another few examples. Um, so, example 2.2, two, we're going to use the rest mass of. The proton and a neutron and we're going to compute the rest mass energy so even though it's not moving we don't have any kinetic energy we still have energy so for my proton we'll call this E naught for my proton is going to be my rest mass of the proton times C squared and the rest mass of a proton is 1.673 times 10 to the negative 27th kilograms and the speed of light 2.998 meters per oh, times 10 times 10 to the 8th meters per second squared or meters per second quantity squared and if I convert that into um, this is an energy so I could I could do this calculation I'm going to get a value of joules I got a kilogram times a meter squared per second squared. That that is that is equivalent to joules. Let me just show you, just in case you're wondering. A newton is a is a force times a joule. A newton. A joule is a newton times a meter. A force times a distance, and that force is a mass times an acceleration. And this gives you kilograms times meter squared per second squared. And so that's what that's what we'd get in this calculation as it stands is a joule, but that number is going to be uh, having times ten to the to really small exponent. So what we're going to do is we're going to convert that to uh, let's convert that to MeV. So we got one MeV is going to be 1.602 times ten to the negative thirteenth joules. And so the kilograms times meter squared per second squared cancels with the joules, and I'm left with MeV. And this is going to be 938.6 MeV. So 938.6 times 10 to the sixth uh, electron volts. Or in terms of MeV, that's just 938.6 MeV. So for the neutron, we don't expect this to be wildly different because the mass of a proton and the mass of a neutron are not that different and uh, the speed of light is the speed of light. So, so we have the rest mass of a neutron is going to be 1.675. Uh, times 10 to the negative 27th kilograms. 
times the speed of light squared, and we'll do the same conversion. And this will end up being 939.8 MeV. So it's about a thousand mega electron volts, so a thousand MeV of, of energy, the, the rest energy of a proton. Uh, same thing with the neutron. Um, there's a number that you're going to want to memorize uh, because the proton and the neutron in terms of atomic mass units instead of kilograms is going to be approximately one, not exactly one, but approximately one. But it's worth memorizing a few things in the nuclear world and, and definitely two of those are going to happen this semester. The one is today. And that is the conversion because that, that's the whole premise of E equals mc squared is energy is mass and mass is energy. And so it's worth, since we're dealing in units of EV or MEV and AMU for mass, we're converting energy to mass, it's worth knowing the conversion from one to the other. And so for one AMU, for if I have something that, that has a mass of one uh, atomic mass unit, then that rest energy is going to be one AMU times C squared. <coughs> times 2.998 times 10 to the 8th meters per second squared. And then I will do the conversion between MeV and joules again. And then I better tack on here going from AMU back to kilograms. So in one AMU there is going to be 1.6605 times 10 to the negative 27th kilograms. So 1 AMU is going to correspond, if I do the math here, is going to be, and we expect it to be pretty close to these other two that we just did, equals 931.5. So this is one thing that you need to memorize. This needs to be part of your vernacular, part of your understanding. So the conversion between energy and mass, energy in units of MeV, and mass in units of AMU is 931.5. OK. Um, so yes, we calculated rest, mass, energy for proton and neutron, but the real takeaway from this example 2.2 is this quantity that, that we will it's going to be to our benefit so that we don't have to keep um, so that we don't have to keep using these conversions here and and here between kilograms and AMU and, and MeV and joules and uh, so that we don't have to keep doing that this is the quantity that we want to memorize okay the last uh, example for today is listed here, example 2.3, determine the kinetic energy at which a proton attains 0.7c. So I'm going 75% the speed of light, 70% the speed of light. And we want to express this energy as both an absolute energy in, in electron volts, um, it's probably going to be MeV, and relative to the proton rest energy. So let's look at the total energy, as we learned, is our kinetic energy plus that rest mass energy. And that's going to be equal to um, m naught c squared over 1 minus v squared over c squared 1 half. So that's my relative mass, um, and in this case we know that V over C is going to be 0 0.7. So I plug that in there, and I divide everything by, by m naught C squared, and so I've got kinetic energy over m naught C squared plus 1 equals uh, 1 minus 0 0.7 squared to the negative 1 half. And so I'm going to subtract the 1 from here. And 
and um, I'm going to find that that kinetic energy in terms of the in terms of the uh, rest mass of, of the of the proton is going to be equal to 0 0.4003. And so I can just uh, multiply over by m, m naught uh, c squared so that my kinetic energy in units of MeV, 4.0.4003 times what I found up here for my proton rest mass energy. And I get that my kinetic energy is 375. Point four MeV. Okay, well that concludes the examples and the lecture content here. Hopefully you're able to gain an appreciation for uh, bits and pieces of the, the history that led us up to uh, the equation that is the most famous equation probably in all of physics and math e equals mc squared. Um, you gain an appreciation for a further appreciation for units on those scales, AMU and, and uh, MEV, uh, we'll, we'll deal with EV and KEV and, and MEV. Um, and next lecture we will start looking at more of the, the nucleus composition, what does it mean to have a certain number of protons and, and neutrons, and more importantly when are things actually stable. When do we, when, we'll talk about when we have a combination of those in certain in, in configurations or environments where they don't want to stay together that way and what does that mean uh, and how does that relate to radioactivity. All right, well that concludes this lecture and uh, see you in lecture three.